szemét. Kint voltál, és horti ellenes vagy. Zsidó kurva anyádat adsz, hát megtapod tőlem, amit akar. I think his background never left him, the way he came from. Vörös, kommunista zsidó. He was looking at life through that eye. What he was, he never forgot. For Robert Kappa, taking pictures was his way of fighting the war against fascism. Instead of carrying a gun, he carried a camera. His works, I think, taught us a lot. Because, uh, you know, he dealt with a very cruel circumstance. He wasn't just an observer. He was really as humane as maybe they don't come like anymore. He really liked people. And I think this is also why people liked him. The thing was that he could uh, be there, take photos, and you didn't know he was there. But you knew he was there. You knew he was there, but you never... You know what I mean? He was one of those people who could make you feel that you had always known him, you could speak to him about anything. was really in some ways a gypsy. You know, the gypsies roamed, and he roamed. He was gorgeous. He was beautiful, and he had this wonderful, musical, romantic, Hungarian accent. He had Beautiful black eyes. Let's always remember his eyes because he had this look, a velvet look. And every girl fell mad in love with Kappa. We all said, <gasps> The war correspondent has his stake, his life, in his own hands. And he can put it on this horse or that horse, or he can put it back in his pocket at the very last gamble. I'm a gambler. I decided to go in with Company E in the first wave. It wasn't pretty. It was kind of ugly and stark and immediate. The pictures were all about chaos and madness. I did everything I could to my camera to get June 6, 44 to look exactly like the Bob Kappa photographs. Estas fotos, como los poemas, se cantará en los tiempos sombríos. These photographs, like poems, will sing in dark times. Y dice Brecht, se cantará. De los tiempos sombríos. And as Brecht says, they will sing about dark times. Robert Kappa was born in Paris at the age of 22. He had arrived a few years earlier, a refugee from Nazi Germany. Before he became Robert Kappa, his name was Andre Friedman. He had fled from Germany with a camera and not much else. He was so poor that he often went hungry. When he was desperate, he would go to a cafe, order one croissant and pocket the whole tray. In the cafes of Montparnasse, he met a lively group of refugees from Germany and Eastern Europe. 
he became fast friends with a young Polish photographer named David Shimon. Everyone called him Shim. Shim was a, a philosopher. Capano, he was a ruffian. Brum, brum, brum. Henri Cartier-Bresson came from a wealthy French family, but he had rebelled against the bourgeois life to become an artist. The three of us were very different and very close together at the same time. There was a unity of aims, of thinking. They worked together using small 35 millimeter cameras, exploring the possibilities of this new photographic tool to get close to the subjects. The three of them were so close, people uh, called them the three musketeers. Along with everyday life, they captured the political drama that was unfolding in the streets of Paris. A coalition of leftist groups called the Popular Front campaigned for election, demanding better conditions for working people. And he and Shim and Henri were all covering these tremendous demonstrations, but they each photographed in their own way. Henri composed very carefully and with a feeling of great compassion, being a sensitive soul. Shim's photographs were more complicated in content. Carper, being a little bit like a bull in the china shop, would go punching to action. Many of his photographs have strong vertical compositions and, and passionate expressions. This is just like meeting another person. You know this picture is by Shim. This picture is by Henri. This picture is by Carper. When the Popular Front won the elections, fascist leagues rioted in the streets. French magazines warned of the end of civilization. In bold graphic images, they exposed the darkening political landscape of Europe and the threat of Hitler's growing army. Anti-fascist articles also appeared in German magazines. This photograph, published in a Berlin journal, was taken in Budapest during a demonstration against the Hungarian dictator, Niklas Horthy. One of the demonstrators was 17-year-old Andre Friedman. He was wounded by a policeman's saber and later arrested. In the big square police headquarters, Cordy's chief of police whistled Beethoven's fifth while beating up long-haired men. I was a young man of 17 with very long hair. The next morning, the police commissioner called my mother and told her that if I left Hungary in 24 hours, certain questions would not be asked. The next day, he left for Berlin. He went to Berlin in order to learn that which is new. Berlin was the great attraction, socially, economically, politically, it was dynamic. Things were happening. The Nazis were not yet in power when Kappa arrived in Germany. Berlin was the cultural capital of the world. Kappa enrolled in journalism classes at the Radical School for Political Studies. He wanted to become a newspaper reporter to fight fascism with words. He moved into a sleazy boarding house and scraped by with a small allowance. When his money ran out, 
His landlady evicted him. I had always loved the feel of rain on my face. But now the rain, without touching my face, went right to my shoes. I had never thought that poverty had anything to do with shoes. Now when I look at poor people, I glance at their feet. For me, he was Bundy. We called him Bundy Never Kappa because it was much later uh, came this name. Eva Beshnio was a childhood friend from Budapest. She had just opened her own photography studio in Berlin. He came and uh, visited me, and he said to me, is photography a nice uh, profession? Just like this. And I said, Bundy, you can't speak about photography on this manner. Like many of her contemporaries, Eva was experimenting with new ways of seeing the world through her lens. She was part of a group of avant-garde photographers who had emigrated to Berlin from Hungary. To be Hungarian is a problem. If your language is so limited by the size of the country that you're born in, you have to find a, a universal language to write with light Photography was a perfect thing for a Hungarian. Photography was flourishing in Berlin. Some of the best photojournalists were represented by an agency called Defot, which was run by a Hungarian. I brought him to Defot and I said, I, I have here a very nice boy, very intelligent and... and uh, smart, can't you give him some job? He said, okay, let him come. I brought uh, Kappa to photography, and I'm very proud of it. Kappa ran errands and worked in the darkroom for a year. Then an extraordinary opportunity arose. Leon Trotsky was going to speak in Copenhagen, and all of the Defote photographers were busy. Kappa said, let me go. I, I make a photograph of him. Let me try. Trotsky was in exile, hunted by Soviet assassins, and security was very tight. I had a little Leica in my pocket, so no one thought I was even a photographer. When some workers came to carry some steel pipes into the chamber, I joined them, and my little Leica and I went to look for Trotsky. His photographs of Trotsky really convey the charisma and passion of this ardent revolutionary. And the photographs were published to great success, not only in Germany, but elsewhere. Kappa was on the brink of a great career at the age of 18, but his success in Germany was doomed. Just a few months later, Hitler seized power, and Kappa wisely left the country. It was not possible to stay. For him, he was Jewish, he was leftist, no. And he, the whole default where, where he worked was finished because it was too leftist. Kappa was a displaced person all of his life. He had to leave Hungary because of his involvement in political issues and make his way to Berlin he was a displaced person in many meanings. He was looking at life through that part, uh, that eye. What he was, he never forgot who he was, uh, where he came from. I think he had, as you say, a chip on his shoulder. Andre Friedman grew up in Budapest, a city divided by wealth, class, and geography. As a boy, he roamed through the graceful streets of Buda, where wealthy aristocrats whiled away the hours in elegant cafes. Then he would head home across the Danube River to the bustling district of Pest, where his parents ran a custom tailoring shop. Julia and Dezo Friedman were as different from each other as Buda and Pest. 
When she was young, Julia had been enchanted by her dashing Romanian husband, but the marriage soon deteriorated into a battlefield. Their modest apartment was crowded with workers making stylish clothes for the rich people of Buda. The business person of our family was my mother, who really was a very hardworking lady, and my father was a very light-hearted fellow. He didn't really believe that uh, work was a very essential part of a Hungarian man's life. And came around 6 p.m., he would want to slip out of the house and go and play cards. On the Pest side stood the Café Modern, where the tailors of Budapest held their daily meetings, which began with complaints about business and ended with Pinnacle. Dezo gambled with petty cash from the family business and often lost it all. I disapproved of his way of life and uh, I admired my mother's sturdy, strong character. So I became a sturdy, strong character young fellow and my brother became a gambler. <laughs> One of Kappa's first assignments in France was to photograph resort life along the Riviera. He spent all of his advance money in a week. When questioned, he insisted that he had to experience the high life in order to photograph it. He was so sorry, but his employer's Leica had been stolen on the beach when he went for a swim. Back in Paris, he couldn't get an assignment, but he kept taking pictures. He used to come and have his photographs developed in uh, my father's little dark room. And uh, when Bob didn't have time to stay, he just dumped his film uh, in front of the door because he was always running around like mad. Kappa had absolutely no success with getting jobs from French editors. Perhaps it was very difficult to become disciplined. In fact, discipline only arrived with Gerda. Gerda Pohorilis was also a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. Like Kappa, she had been jailed for protesting against fascism and had barely escaped to Paris. Gerda was able to speak French and other languages, and she was always beautifully made up. And she was very vivacious. Gerda knew how important presentation was. She was a very strong person, much like Julia. Imagine, mother, my hair is short, I'm wearing a tie, my shoes are shined. I've become a gentleman, washed, cleaned, and pressed, like a petty bourgeois from Buddha. Their relationship would be stormy and complicated, but in the summer of 1935, they were simply in love. Never before in my life have I been so happy. Now, only the pick and the spade could separate Garda and me. When they got back, they found a one-room apartment near the Eiffel Tower. I knew that it was the greatest thing in his life at the time. He was really, really, it was passion. Gerda introduces me to every editor and writes articles besides. On the other hand, she not only doesn't darn my socks, she doesn't do anything about the holes in her stockings. She runs around so much that she wears one out every day. She would go around and sell the pictures to editors. She was very persuasive, but not quite persuasive enough. It was time for a new strategy. And they decided they would invent an American photographer named Robert Kaffa. Very successful, uh, so famous that uh, nobody could ever really get close to him. He was always away on assignment or at some glamorous resort on vacation. The name Capra seems to be a play on the, the name of Frank Capra, 
who had just won an Academy Award. And then Gerda decided that she, fancying Greta Garbo, would call herself Gerda Taro, and that they would work together as partners. Eventually, the ruse was discovered that Andre Friedman was making the photographs that Gerda was selling as Robert Kaffas. And what they decided at that point was uh, that uh, since the photographs were so good and they were getting published, that Andre Friedman might just as well become Robert Kappa. People say he created his own character, but he fit it. He created a character that took advantage of all his innate qualities. I mean, if you had written a character like Bob Kappa and you knew him, you'd say, the perfect person to play this role is Bob Kappa. Dear good mother, I'm working under a new name. My name is now Robert Kappa. It's like being born again, but this time without hurting anybody. You can't talk about the war in Spain without talking about Kappa and his photographs, but very particularly about this photograph. It portrays the moment a man dies, and he receives death, as our poet Miguel says. He receives death on his feet, falling, but on his feet. He loses his life, but maintains his dignity. Fascist planes bombed Madrid with support from Hitler and Mussolini. Madrid was under siege. Madrid was an experimentation for the most modern weapons made in Germany. They bombed us when we were in line buying bread. They bombed us and we never knew when the planes would come and kill us. He was more than anxious to show the effects of the war on the common people. And the pictures he was able to shoot showed the population in a state of terror. The pictures he caught of the people on the bombardment are extraordinary. Of course, what's not seen there but you have to know that he was standing there while they were running. There were no smart bombs in those days, and the bombs just came out of there in strings and fell wherever they fell. Always the same, the sirens, the panic rush, the fracas of the bombs. Then as the dust settles, people go off to the morgue to see if, by chance, the son, the father, the mother that did not come home is on the lists. What did this woman do? She was certainly neither a Republican nor a supporter of Franco. She was a human being living her life, asking, what is the reason why this happened? What did I do to make this happen? This is the great tragedy. And that's what Kappa knew how to express. Kappa's photographs were published in journals and magazines around the world. Spain was his war. It was the first opportunity for the men and women of his generation to confront fascism militarily. Volunteers from all over the world came to fight for democracy in Spain. Gerda Taro, a passionate supporter of the Spanish Republic, came to Spain with Capa as a journalist. He taught her how to take pictures, and they worked together side by side. 
As Gerda gained confidence, their separate identities mattered less to them, to the point that they even uh, decided to have a stamp made up that would say simply, photo, kappa, and taro. They'd really become a team. With an IMO movie camera, they shot newsreel footage for the March of Time. They camped with the soldiers, capturing everyday life with their cameras. Gerda probably shot this footage of Kappa. I don't remember photos of other wars that concentrated so much on the rank and file. Not on the big shots. Not on a lot of braid and brass, but the guys in the trenches. This was a cause they were willing to die for. They risked their lives many times to cover the fighting up close. In the aftermath of one terrible battle, Gerda said, when you think of all the fine people who have been killed, you get the feeling that somehow it's unfair to still be alive. When they came back, because they went several times, I saw their work. When I got together with them, I saw a couple in love. And it was delightful to see. They loved each other and they could work very well with each other. It was ideal, really, but very short. In July 1937, fighting broke out in the town of Brunete, just west of Madrid. Gerda grabbed her camera and raced to the scene. It was the most violent. Lasted for 21 days, and uh, casualties were very heavy. What can I tell you? Two battalions went in, and one battalion came out. The general ordered Gerda to leave, but she refused. Nothing could hold her back as she raced across the battlefield, taking pictures as she ran. My whole squad died, practically. And uh, one of them died right over there. The loyalist soldiers began to retreat. Tanks and trucks careened through the field, bombarded by planes and artillery fire. In the chaos and panic, the Loyalist tank swerved out of control. Gerda was riding on the running board of a car when a tank crashed into her. She died the next day. Kappa learned of her death by reading the newspaper. Sitting in a dentist chair, he turned the page, and there was the headline, Gerda Taro killed at Brunete. A huge procession accompanied Gerda's body to a cemetery in Paris. She would have been 26 years old that day. Louis Aragon, editor of Ce Soir, came to the funeral with Kappa. Well, I saw him crying. It was very strange. And the Hagon was holding him. And we came from the cemetery. The death of Gerdan was terrible. All his hope and all his future disappeared in once. It changed him. I'm sure he changed completely in this time. Dear mother, I'm so nervous and crazy, all I can do is pull myself together and work hard. With time, I shall be more tolerable. Kappa went to the other side of the world, trying to forget his grief.
He was in Hankow to cover the Japanese invasion of China. Kappa was working with a film crew he had met in Spain. Slowly, I'm feeling more and more like a hyena. Even if you know the value of your work, it gets under your skin. Everybody suspects that you are a spy or that you want to make money at the expense of other people. The war photographer's most fervent wish is for unemployment. Six months later, he was back in Spain. The fascists were winning the war. The hundred miles of road from Barcelona to the French border was black with people fleeing Franco's imported legions. They carried their bundles and walked with blistered feet toward the freedom of democratic France. The newspaper men took their pictures, but the world was not very interested. And in a few short years, there were many other people on many other roads running and falling before the same troops and the very same swastikas. Kappa's photographs captured the horror of the Spanish Civil War. Picture Post declared that he was the greatest war photographer in the world. He was 25 years old. When he returned to Paris, he photographed the Tour de France bicycle race, shooting backwards from a motorcycle. In April 1939, I was in Megève, in the French Alps, and I was skiing, and at one point I stopped, and another skier actually fell right in front of me. He looked up, and it was Kappa. A good photographer is always prepared for the unexpected, so I took this picture of Kappa. And then he took my Rolleiflex and took a photograph of me. In June 1940, Paris fell to the Nazis. Kappa was on assignment in Mexico when he heard the terrible news. Dear little brother, European news is miserable and it depresses me very much. The world was never as sad as it is now. Three months later, German planes began bombing London. Kappa arrived to cover the Blitz for Life magazine. That was where our house was, and that is our dog going across the street, and you can see where the, the bomb damage and such like has been up there. At, up at the top. His pictures were also published in a book called The Battle of Waterloo Road, featuring the Gibbs family. That is Tom's plate. That would be our brothers. Our brothers. Him and her didn't finish their dinners. I was the littlest in the family, and I used to sit there and wait and see how much they left. That would be the way Kappa would take a photo. Mm. You didn't sort of see him standing there going, I'll take your picture. He, he didn't. But you knew he was there. You knew he was there, but you never... You know what I mean? He wasn't sort of up your nose type thing. He was... He was there. The Gibbs family represented very wonderfully the undaunted spirit of the British, how the Blitz, far from demoralizing the English as the Germans had hoped, had in fact done just the opposite. It had rallied the British spirit. When Kappa came to do this book, the bombing wasn't anywhere near over. You would have a night where it eased, and you would think, oh yes, it's getting better, didn't we? 
Like the night Dad said, oh, well, none of us will go to the shelter tonight, we'll stay at home. And it was the worst night of the bombing we'd ever had. We had to run across the road. We used to go to the shelter that's down underneath this church. People from the church army used to fetch us down tea and we would all have cups of tea together. Most of the ladies and the gentlemen were all killed afterwards, but they did used to come down there and fetch the tea to us and we used to sit around and chat. We all had our own bunks that we went to. And we was in the very end one, which was right under the front of the church where, where the, the actual bomb hit. came in. It hit the top of the actual altar itself and blew. If it hadn't hit that altar, it could have come straight through the floor to us. But when we came up in the morning, it was totally devastated, the church. There was no pews left, was there? No. So we all set to and cleaned up the church as best we could. And then people gave chairs and we sorted ourselves out. Father Hutch, which was the priest, decided that we would all get together and have one service. What those pictures tell you of the men, yeah. and what they look like, what they are, and, the and what they were. Yeah. Very, and then you've got ends. the difference of the children and their faces. I mean, not everybody can take a photo like some of those are. It's there. It was in him. From England, Kappa went to New York City. His mother and brother had moved there a few years earlier and were living on the Upper West Side. Julia was thrilled to have both of her sons with her. She had been, in fact, uprooted, and she clung to cap out. And he wasn't here that much, you know. Bob, of course, was Julia's favorite son. From the moment that Bob was born, because he had this little six extra finger, um, she thought that he was going to be a very special person. He knew how to keep her happy with a minimum of time. Uh, for example, when she went to Paris, he would send her roses to her hotel room and he would introduce her to all his friends and take her around, but then he would vanish again. Kappa went west to photograph an elk hunt. I have become a complete cowboy. They are big, tough, and healthy, and have so much fun at whatever they are doing. They don't really give a damn what's happening in Europe. He was working for Life magazine on stories that took him all across America. Everywhere he went, he managed to connect with people. In spite of his unusual way of speaking. His accent was Hungarian, and his English although very clear, had this very definite European accent. He spoke, of course, in this language that he called Capanese, which was a horrible English. I think he was impossible to imitate. Capanese was a language that only was spoken by one person in the world, and that was Cap. He had great political instinct. Most Hungarians do, I think. And uh, we sent him to Florida to cover Senator Taft, who was fishing, literally fishing, for the Republican nomination. Taft's press agents arranged a fishing scene. To make sure he caught one, they hooked a sailfish on the line. Kappa photographed Senator Taft catching the same dead fish over and over. Kappa just calmly photographed the whole procedure, and life made a very funny story, which was very embarrassing to Senator Taft. Kappa was getting restless doing lightweight stories for Life magazine. He desperately wanted to get back to Europe, but he couldn't get a visa. 
When America entered the war, Kappa, as a Hungarian citizen, was suddenly an enemy alien. He was ordered to turn in his cameras and not to leave New York. He sent a letter in his own defense to the State Department. I wrote to immigration that I was born in Budapest, that the Hungarian consulate since Hitler's annexation of Hungary refuses to say that I'm not Hungarian, nor will they say that I am. That so long as Hitler is in charge of Hungary, I definitely refuse to say that I'm Hungarian. He ended by saying that he hated the Nazis and hoped that his pictures could be used against them. In April 1942, he finally got his visa and left for London. I told her the facts about my dancing. She said my rumba wasn't really bad and could be improved in no time. I answered that in 10 years no one had succeeded in making any improvements. She said she had a brand new idea. I was afraid I had one too. Kappa called her Pinky after her strawberry blonde hair. They met in England while Kappa was waiting for accreditation from the U.S. Army. She was married to a pilot, which made her just unavailable enough. To prepare for life at the front, he had a special uniform made by a Bond Street tailor. He said goodbye to Pinky and left for North Africa. I told her that I was a gypsy and a newspaper man, that I was very sorry and very glad because she was far too lovely. In Tunisia, he joined American troops as they advanced against the Germans. Dear mother, I would love to be able to bring your birthday present myself, but Rommel is keeping us still busy here. From North Africa, Kappa went to Sicily to cover the Allied invasion. He spent seven months with American troops in the hard fight for Italy. I dragged myself from mountain to mountain, from foxhole to foxhole, taking pictures of mud, misery, and death. Every five yards, a foxhole. He needs at least one dead soldier. Kappa was with General Patton in Sicily when Palermo surrendered. In the ruined city of Naples, he photographed a tragic story. Young boys had turned on the Germans, their hated allies, shooting at them with whatever weapons they could find. Many of the boys were killed. Inside the room were 20 primitive coffins, not well enough covered with flowers and too small to hide the dirty little feet of children. These children of Naples had stolen rifles and bullets and had fought the Germans for 14 days. These were my truest pictures of victory. After nearly a year at the front, Kappa longed to get back to London and to Pinky. He knew that the invasion of France was imminent. He was glad to find Pinky waiting for him. They moved into a suite at the posh Dorchester Hotel and proceeded to spend his royalty checks in style. Journalists from all the Allied countries were gathering in London to wait for the invasion of France. Ernest Hemingway arrived. He and Kappa had become friends during the war in Spain. His nickname was Papa, and I soon adopted him as a father. To prove my devotion and prosperity, I decided to give him a party. The attraction of free booze combined with Mr. Hemingway proved irresistible. It was a time of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Kappa was certainly one of the liveliest of the partiers and uh, the most reckless of the gamblers. People say that gamblers like to lose, but the big thrill is to lose everything and then to be reborn. Hundreds of ships set out under cover of night to 
carry Allied soldiers into the most decisive and brutal battle of the war, the invasion of Normandy. At 4 a.m., we were assembled on the open deck. 2,000 men stood in perfect silence. Whatever they were thinking, it was some kind of prayer. Kappa chose the most dangerous mission, to go in with the first soldiers to land on Omaha Beach. He would be the only photographer in the first wave. We got out of the boat and started waiting. And then I saw men falling and had to push past their bodies. The bullets tore holes in the water around me, and I made for the nearest steel obstacle. My picture frames were filled with shrapnel smoke, burnt tanks, and sinking barges. Every piece of shrapnel found a man's body. I did not dare to take my eyes off the finder and frantically shot frame after frame. Everything came apart. All that we trained for just seemed to go by the boards. And I was so exhausted physically and mentally that I just collapsed in that spot. It was a struggle, not against the Germans or anything, it was a struggle to survive, to save your life. And uh, fortunately, I was able to do that. This photograph of Ed Regan is one of Kappa's few surviving pictures of D-Day. A nervous darkroom assistant in London ruined most of the negatives. Only 11 images remain. Life magazine published all of them. And I'm only sad that the other 134 shots that were destroyed in the laboratory couldn't have been witnessed by the entire world because he probably got the greatest photo record of that invasion and of that morning. That morning, Kappa had pulled himself onto a barge full of wounded and dying men bound for England. He was offered a plane to take him to London, but he refused. He returned to the beachhead on the first available boat. Nearly 10,000 Allied soldiers died on the shores of Normandy. Kappa stayed with American troops as they fought their way through France. really hate the war, but you have to admit that there is something exciting about your ability not only to test your own limits, but to participate in something big that is happening. When you're taking risks and your life is in danger, your adrenaline is pumping so high you are feeling more alive the closer you are to death than a normal circumstance. You're both completely terrified and calm at the same time. You try to focus on this, this camera and you look through this hole and that hole becomes like, it becomes a movie that you're watching through there in some ways. And that helps you put your fear into another place. The shells started raining down on us, and I jumped into a big ditch, scared to death. And this man jumps in. He's very calm through this whole thing. And uh, he's, he like, picks up a conversation as though, and he starts talking about Tolstoy. I'll never forget that. It's like this was just some noise going around. You know, and uh, you'd hear a yell every once in a while, a scream. But he paid no attention to, to that. He just kept talking to me. And he calmed me down. Then the shelling died away, you know, and he kind of smiled at me and said goodbye and, and hopped out again and disappeared. And uh, I crawled out, you know, and I said to somebody, who's that? And they said, this is a photographer named Kappa. And that was the only time I ever saw him.
Papa found himself really loved by the American soldiers and officers. He was a good man to have around. Many units even came to regard him as a good luck. That uh, if they had Bob Kappa with them, things were going to go well. Kappa took all the same risks as the soldiers he photographed, from the beaches of Normandy to the Battle of the Bulge. In northern France, he prepared for his most harrowing experience of the war. That uh, picture was taken when I was 19 years old. I all heard this voice saying, uh, Soldier, would you mind standing up? I'd like to take your picture. I think the reason he wanted to take my picture was the fact that I had the Cheyenne Warlock. I, we had a Cheyenne Indian in my demolition section. And uh, as a result, we used to go into combat with a Cheyenne Warlock. You have something, you know, hey, we're different, we're rough, we're tough, we're better. Kappa had volunteered to parachute into Germany with the 17th Airborne Division. They would be jumping directly into enemy fire. It was uh, very uh, fearless in a sense, almost reckless. The idea was to get the photograph and uh, he would go to almost any lengths to get close action good photographs. Part of you isn't thinking or feeling, and part of you is. You know you're going. Hell, you're, the plane's in the air. You know you're going. And you're not exactly sure what's going to be there when you get there. You know what is supposed to be there. I started to think over my whole life. It was like a movie where the projection machine has gone crazy. I saw everything I ever ate, ever did, and I got to the end in 12 minutes flat. 600 feet below us was the Rhine. The green light flashed, and the boys yelled, Umbriago! Seventeen thousand men parachuted into the Rhine Valley that day. More than a third of them died there. The most amazing thing I ever saw is the way everybody just lies on the ground when they get down. It seemed like two minutes and everybody was just lying there. They were shooting at you as you were coming down. So sometimes uh, some of the troops didn't quite make it to the ground alive. Ten yards away were tall trees. Some of the men who had jumped after me had landed in them, and now they were hanging helplessly. That's the last, last good photograph of my right foot, because uh, I left my right foot in Europe. War is gruesome, and somebody has to show it. I, I often wonder if I could have done it, to be perfectly honest with you. It was one thing to be going someplace where they're throwing things at you when you can shoot back. If you don't have anything but a camera, you don't stop bullets with cameras. Kappa entered Leipzig with the United States Army. German snipers kept firing even after the city had surrendered. Kappa climbed onto the balcony of an apartment building where American soldiers were shooting back. The boy had a clean, open, very young face, and his gun was still killing fascists. I clicked my shutter. That was the last one of the boy alive. For Kappa, the most important moment of the war had been the liberation of Paris. The road to Paris was open, and every Parisian was out in the street to touch the first tank, to kiss the first man. 
Never were there so many who were so happy so early in the morning. I felt that this entry into Paris had been made especially for me. On a tank made by Americans, I was returning to Paris, the beautiful city where I first learned to eat, drink, and love. Thousands of faces in the finder of my camera became more and more blurred. That finder was very, very wet. We drove through the quarter where I had lived for six years, and my concierge was waving a handkerchief, and I was yelling to her from the rolling tank, C'est moi! C'est moi! Kappa had been fighting fascism for nearly a decade in Spain, in China, in North Africa, and all of Europe. He was 32 years old, and the war was finally over. Kappa was at the Ritz Bar in Paris with the writer Erwin Shaw when they saw an astonishing sight. Ingrid Bergman walking up the stairs. They immediately sent a note to her room. We were planning on sending you flowers, inviting you to dinner this evening. But after consultation, we discovered it was possible to pay for the flower or the dinner, but not both. So mother went to dinner and she found Bob Kappa tremendously uh, charming and amusing. And uh, in fact, she fell in love with him. Bergman was on a whirlwind tour of Europe to entertain American troops. When Kappa went to Berlin on assignment, they found each other again. It's your merry mind that I love, and there are very few merry minds in a man's life. Bergman had just won an Academy Award for her starring role in Gaslight. She soon had to return to Hollywood for her next film. She was starring in Alfred Hitchcock's romantic thriller, Notorious. Halfway through production, Kappa arrived. He got on the set as a still photographer. Kappa reached a certain point in his career when he no longer wanted to be a war photographer. And he thought he might like to go in the movie business. The movie business, unlike war, is quite boring. Well, quite like war in that you're bored a lot of the time and you get a little action sporadically. And Kappa found it very boring. Kappa came to the set every day, but he and Bergman had to be very careful not to show their feelings in public. Years later, she would reveal their affair in her autobiography. This part of being in love with Kappa while she was married was not easy, not easy at all, she says, because I was so moral, so prudish, you might say, but I wanted very much to be with him. While waiting for chances to see Bergman alone, Kappa explored the Hollywood social scene. He was, of course, socially very acceptable. First of all, he was nice looking. He was, had a good sense of humor. He was famous in a certain circle. Uh, and he was a single man. But Kappa was not happy in Tinseltown. He said to me, I hate to go to people's houses. And that's why I don't like L.A., because in L.A. everything takes place in people's houses. I want to be in a cafe, so when I get finished, I get up and I go to the next place. Bored on the set and restless in Hollywood, Kappa looked for other ways to entertain himself. He briefly became Hamza the Egyptian in a B-movie called Temptation. Where's Abdallah? Abdallah sick. Me cousin. Doing work. Me, Hamza. All right, bring us the coffee, Abdallah. Me, Hamza. Uh, never mind, make it quick. He decided that the movie business was not for him. Hollywood is the biggest mess of shit I ever stepped in. He said goodbye to Bergman 
and left to do a story in Turkey. Mother was ready to ask for a divorce and marry Kappa, but Kappa said, I cannot marry you. If they say Korea tomorrow and we're married and have a child, I won't be able to go to Korea, and that's impossible. I'm not the marrying kind. So that's it. You won't stay here and I can't go with you. It would be the wrong thing. Apparently, Alfred Hitchcock wrote Rare Window, um, inspired to this love affair between my mother and Bob Kappa. Can you see me driving down to the fashion salon in a Jeep, wearing combat boots and a three-day beard? Will that make a hit? Well, I could see you looking very handsome and successful in a dark blue flannel suit. Now, uh, let's stop talking nonsense, shall we? I guess I'd better start setting up for dinner. He wasn't made to be married. I mean, he was a single person. He loved to be surrounded by friends, girls, but to attach himself down someplace with somebody, I think he was really afraid of it. I'm a newspaper man again, and it is all right. I sleep in strange hotels, read during the night. It's good to work, to think, to be lonely. In New York City in the spring of 1947, Kappa realized a lifelong dream. He called it Magnum. We chose that name on account of uh, when we were meeting. It was a bottle of champagne. Though I don't drink that stuff. I'm for red wine. His idea was to form a cooperative of independent photographers. First, he convinced his old friend Shim to join him. Shim persuaded Henri Cartier-Bresson, and the three musketeers were together again. George Roger, an English photographer Kappa had met during the war, signed on as the fourth founding member. Oh my God, that was something. Because they were so far apart, you know, from background, education, everything. I mean, it was amazing the way they could actually work together. Cartier-Bresson spent the next three years working in Asia. George Roger set off down the Nile to cover the far reaches of Africa. Shim traveled through Europe, focusing on children affected by war. Kappa became the roving photographer. His first big scoop for Magnum was in Russia. John Steinbeck, who had been a war correspondent with Kappa, helped him get a visa. They boarded a plane bound for Moscow. We just wanted to find out how Russian people look, eat, make love, and what they talk about. It was a great coup to get behind the Iron Curtain. The story sold for the enormous sum of $20,000, and Magnum kept the copyright. The big, big thing which Kappa brought by creating Magnum is to be independent. I think he invented the idea of photographers owning their own negatives so that they can sell the pictures to more than one magazine at a time. You have no idea the consequence of that, which means that every photographer were working not only for Life magazine or Look, but for themselves. That was what we were fighting for, to control our works. And uh, it's a way to be respected and not to be uh, employees and tools of big magazines. That was the main thing of Magnum. In May 1948, when Ben-Gurion proclaimed the founding of the State of Israel, Kappa was there to photograph the event. It was an electric, a historic moment when the British ended their mandate and their rule of Palestine. 
Bob Kappa, who was among the handful of photographers who were on the wharf in Haifa port. And it was very clear that there was somebody who was very energetic moving around there with his cameras and trying to get the picture from every angle possible. Now I was sitting on a building along with British officers overlooking this ceremony of lowering of the Union Jack. That very day, the surrounding Arab countries invaded Israel. The new country born out of victorious battle is granted no peace. Kappa joined the troops fighting in the Negev desert. He felt with the people, not only on a human universal level, but also it was his people. Just a few months before, Kappa had visited Budapest for the first time in 15 years. He found the city in ruins. Many of his friends and relatives had been murdered by the Nazis. Kappa wrote an article about the tragic story of the Jews in Hungary. They had believed themselves safe, even when they were rounded up for forced labor. By the end of the war, half a million Hungarian Jews had died in the camps. These immigrants are the motley remains of a people who 2,000 years ago left these shores to scatter to the far corners of the earth. And now, they are coming back. The soldiers were very young. All those 17, 18 young old boys and girls, of which I was one, there was something so naive and uh, hopeful and really uh, romantic in a way that today I don't think we are as romantic anymore. When fighting broke out in Tel Aviv, Kappa was almost killed. A bullet pierced his thigh. They went too far, or rather got too close this time. He vowed that he would never again risk his life to photograph war. Back in Paris, Kappa's gambling became legendary. He really was fascinated by the races, and it was part of what kept him alive gambling. I mean, what kept him, what fired him up. Sometimes he borrowed money from Magnum to bet on the horses. And he used to get good bets and good tips. And uh, when he lost, well, he lost. That was part of the gamble. When he won, his gambling kept the office going. The way the Paris office was run was quite bizarre. And most of the big discussions took place in the bistro down at the bottom. Kappa playing the pinball machine and discussing what major story we ought to put in for picture post next week. Before you can tilt, he says, I think it would be a good idea if we would go to Germany to do a story on Germany. Yes, sir, and off you went. He sent me like this to Persia. You know that he never had any place to live. He was living only in hotels and with girlfriends. He asked me to come and see him. He even told me the hotel, the room number. I go to the room number, knock at the door, and I hear a voice of Kappa, come in. I got in the room, nobody. And I heard somebody having a bath. And Kappa, he asked me to come. And he started to talk to me. You know, I was trying to join Magnum. So Kappa, a 
the people for five minutes, showed him a few pictures, and with a big uh, hop on, on my shoulder, he said, OK, come along with us. Kappa brought many talented young photographers into Magnum. Some people said Magnum is a family. In a way, yes. Obviously, father of the family was Kappa, and uh, we would all go to him to complain if no job, if no money, and he would listen, and he would really put forward some ideas for big projects. Magnum's reputation was growing as the agency representing the best photojournalists. Kappa himself was famous, not just as a legendary war photographer, but as a celebrated man about town. Sometimes you can fall in love in five minutes, but you can fall into friendship in five minutes too. So I must say that from the time I met him first, it was an instantaneous friendship on both sides. We understood each other. In the summer of 1948, Kappa went to the south of France to photograph Francois Gillot and Pablo Picasso. It was not for a day, it came for about two weeks. That also was probably his method. You see, he would live with you, spend the day with you doing what you were doing. His rhythm was very fast. Everything he was doing, he was not doing, you know, slowly. He was doing it instantaneously. He did not simmer taking a photograph a little bit more like this, a little more like that, or waiting for the exact like, etc. No, he, he felt like it, bang. So that's why, certainly, the thing you could say is that Kappa would entertain you. It became a kind of amusement to do this or that with him. With Kappa, you, you, just, um, you just lived with him and in front of him. Kappa had become the man he invented, a successful American photographer, always away on assignment, photographing and hobnobbing with the rich and famous around the world. It was the best of times for Kappa, but very soon it would become the worst of times. He would call 1953 his black year. One day in Paris, he got the call from the American embassy to turn in his passport this was a tremendous blow for him. One might say that it shattered his world. It was the height of the Cold War. Although he had become a United States citizen, Kappa's trip to Russia and his participation in the Spanish Civil War were seen as evidence of communist sympathies. In fact, Kappa had made up his mind about the party a long time ago. When he was 17, he had met secretly with a communist recruiter. By four in the morning, we had covered most of Budapest's empty streets and all aspects of world revolution. He found that I was a fuzzy intellectual with five half-digested books in me and a bourgeois father. I found that his views were far less radical than I had hoped, and that his looking over his shoulder was a rather pretentious act. I decided not to join the Communist Party. Although he had ideals of social justice, he was much too smart from an early age on ever to have fallen for the propaganda talk and for the seductions of communism. Without his passport, Kappa could not work as a journalist. He had to pay a lawyer $10,000 to clear his name and get his passport back. He was terribly anxious about having enough money to keep uh, things rolling. And uh, he was actually tired of uh, carrying all the burdens of Magnum on his shoulders. To escape from his troubles, Kappa raced around Europe, photographing movie stars, doing stories about resort life for illustrated and holiday magazines. I think he was playing in life and happy, fun, drinker, party, uh, lover side of him. Never hide totally that sort of nostalgia in himself that you could feel. And you could see it in his eyes. His friend Erwin Shaw wrote, 
Only in the morning does Kappa show that the tragedy and sorrow through which he has passed have left their marks on him. Then Kappa drinks down a strong bubbling draft, tries on his afternoon smile, sets out, carefully light-hearted, to those places where this homeless man can be at home. For the young models, for all this crowd of young girls who came to Paris, this was the great god, except for one woman, and I think this was his real great love, uh, Jamie Hammond. This was the only thing which really counted for him, I thought. Jamie was one of the few people Kappa confided in. I must do something again, not only to make a living, but to live again, to get back to real work. The Dogville and Biarritz and Motley movie period is over. Early in 1954, Kappa got some good news. He received an invitation to come to Japan to exhibit his work. He had uh, such a big uh, reception, like a hero, which he was in a sense. So that was, uh, I think, very helpful for his morale, you know. I'm very happy with the Orient. Japan is a photographer's paradise. While he was in Japan, he took many, many pictures of children. And those pictures struck me. The way, say, he kneeled down the low enough to children's eye level. I think all of that's overwhelmed me. That explains something about he, his quality as a human being. It was a great opportunity for him, and after two weeks, he was unfortunately offered an assignment by Life magazine to cover the French war and into China. I called Tokyo. I said, Bob, you know, you don't have to go. This isn't our war. Cornell Kappa was distraught to learn that his brother might go into another war. I much appreciate your calling, but be assured that I didn't take the job from a sense of duty, but with real great pleasure. I think that the struggle was for him to get again to Kappa. He wanted to work again, and that he hoped to do in Vietnam. What amazed me about Kappa was that um, he was a legendary figure, and he'd covered four wars before he came to Vietnam. I expected somebody, well, really a lot older in age, and actually he was very young, I thought. I thought he was very young. I was 29, he was 40. He was very glad the, the Vietnamese people were winning the war, very glad, as was I. There was no, no question about that. It was an ardent feeling we had. He had a great feeling all his life for mourning because he never really got over the loss of Gerda. So in Vietnam, we photographed a woman sitting at the grave of a husband or son. Kappa photographed Vietnamese people living in the shadow of war. He planned to call his story Bitter Rice. The war was almost over and the French were retreating. Kappa joined a French convoy on a last-ditch mission in the Red River Delta. The roads and fields were mined everywhere by both sides. Kappa was riding with a few soldiers and reporters. They warned him not to leave the convoy. He had a very famous saying, which was something like, if your picture is not good enough, you were not close enough. I don't think he was careless. He said this many times. I will be totally careful, except when there's only one place from which I can take a picture, and the picture I want, he said, then I'm gonna go there. 
when the trucks halted, Kappa told his fellow journalists, I'm going up the road a little bit. Look for me when you get started again. I mean, just looking at the pictures, you could see he was sticking with the soldiers. He was a pro. This is the last picture Robert Kappa ever took. He had stepped on a landmine. They rushed to where Kappa's body was, but there was no way to save him. He was gone by the time the ambulance came. Robert Kappa was given a military funeral in Hanoi. He was the first American war correspondent to die in Vietnam. We marched behind the casket. It was really very moving. Kappa's body was sent home. The army offered to bury him in Arlington National Cemetery. Julia said her son was not a soldier, but a man of peace. He was buried in a Quaker cemetery just outside New York City. Cornell stood and put a prayer shawl over and recited Kaddish. And uh, Julia wanted to jump into the grave. And Julia was beyond herself for years. She never got over his death. Robert was her pride and joy, the light of her life. But she was also extremely angry. She was angry at the whole business that uh, put him in harm's way at a time that he really should have retired from harm's way. Kappa had covered countless battles in five wars fought in 10 different countries. He left behind 70,000 negatives, an extraordinary record of the darkness of war and the light of the human spirit. It's a way of loving to take pictures and hating at the same time, fighting. Must keep on 